Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Computers are so complex these days. I'm sorry, so it took uh, a few minutes to set up everything. Anyway, um, the title of my talk is uh, Decompilers and Beyond. So we'll, I will talk about uh, decompilers and uh, more precisely about uh, the decompiler I built. Uh, well, it was available, so it's available since the last year, but uh, it took me uh, maybe five or more years to build it. Because it was not that something simple. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first question, uh, why do we need the compilers and uh, do we need them at all? Uh, because uh, the compiler is a big thing, it's a very complex uh, piece of software and this complexity must be justified. Maybe we can go uh, without uh, the compilers and solve our problems without them. Then we'll switch to, uh, we'll discuss uh, a typical decompiler design, how to build decompilers, and in my opinion, there are some misconceptions how to do it, and I will just uh, show you how I do it, I build mine, and after that, of course, there will be some demos, uh, there is no, no question of making a presentation without a demo, a live demos, and I hope that uh, everything will go smoothly. And uh, after that, we will be in position to, to, to discuss uh, new tools and analysis that are, me, that are become uh, available because of the decompiler. So because we have a decompiler and we can use it to build something bigger, uh, more intelligent, more powerful on top of it. So that's our future uh, as I see it. And after that, if you have any free time, hope so, there will be some questions and everything like that. So the first question uh, about decompilers and if we need them at all. Uh, you all know that we use uh, disassemblers to analyze binary code. Uh, and uh, disassemblers are something quite simple. What they do, they take a binary file like PE file, MS-DOS executable, or just a stream of bytes, and they convert this stream of bytes into instructions. So it's very simple one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, I could say that a nice, uh, simple disassembler can be written maybe within one or two days. It's a very simple task. You create a table and, like, for example, 0x90 is, is mapped to no operation, no, and so on, so on. So simple uh, disassemblers, uh, they just produce a listing with instructions. But if you worked a little bit with the real world examples, real world programs, you understand that this is usually not enough and you need something bigger, something uh, better, more powerful. Uh, I hope that you heard about IDE Pro and uh, you know that IDE Pro can annotate the listing. Uh, it has a very good navigation system. Uh, well, you know the difference between a good and bad disassembler especially if you spend your time working with uh, trying to analyze programs and uh, it's a very time consuming activity. All these assemblers, they have one inherent problem. Their output stays very, very low level. It's just an assembler listing. So what you have is just listing of instructions. And these instructions are kind of very small, and you know you have these CPU registers, memory cells, addresses, but you as analyst, you have to map these instructions into something high level. You have to give a meaning to these instructions. If you have a, poop, uh, if you have a push, then some instructions, and then you have a pop, the same register, let's say, Based on my experience, I, I would say, it looks like we are saving a register at the beginning and we are restoring at the end, but I have to do it. A disassembler will never show me that, it, that this, is, uh, this is how we save a register and uh, restore registers. So what we do, the analyst, what it, he does, he mentally maps assembly instructions into higher level abstractions and concepts. At the beginning, it's a very difficult task. And uh, you can say that it's a very steep learning curve, and, and that's why anyone who can read assembly text 
is considered as being highly skilled uh, specialist, which is true. But on the other hand, it becomes a very boring task after a while because you know all this stuff. And it's always the same, repeating, repeating, repeating. So in other words, I would say that the output is very boring and it's inhuman because humans are not very good with handling this repetitive code. Take uh, this listing on the right. You see that we take a byte and we put it into the output buffer. We take another byte, we copy it, and so on, so on, so on. You read this, and after while you look at it, and you say, okay, I understand that we copy bytes here. But the, the amount of text to analyze is very big. Uh, you have an adaptation to skip this and to say, okay, we just copy bytes here. But are you sure that we copy bytes? We don't swap them. You cannot be sure unless you read. You have to read that the first byte is copied to the first position in the output buffer. The second byte is copied to the second byte in the, se uh, to the second position, and so on. If you miss something, your analysis will be wrong. So at the same time, it's boring, but you must stay alert. You could, cannot say, oh, OK, it's this. I, co I collapse it into one line. By the way, it would be very nice to, to be able to collapse this into one line, uh, or even maybe two, three lines. Uh, by the way, in either you can do it, but uh, you have to do it manually. And uh, again, something that uh, you lose your time. If you take another sample of these two, two instructions on the left, um, okay, it's nothing, not, not rocket science. Look at this, you say, we take ECX, we take ECX multiplied by two, two plus one makes three. Okay, what do we do with that? What, what do we do with that? We, we put it into ESI, and after we multiply it by two, by two, three multiplied by two makes six. Okay, so we take six, uh, we take ECX multiplied by six and add EX. You see that it takes time. It's much better to have one line like this, and you are done. And a decompiler could generate a code, code like that for us. So my opinion is, and it was like this since the beginning, we need decompilers. They are very helpful. Uh, I'm, so especially today, when we have megabytes, megabytes of code, and the listings are so huge, so nobody, no human being can analyze everything, all instructions, everything understands, so, uh, all antivirus companies, and uh, everyone who works is uh, reverse engineering seriously, they cannot analyze everything. So what they do, they just try to locate interesting parts of the code and uh, on, analyze only that, that. But even that is difficult because uh, even there you have a lot of code to analyze. So we need the compiler, but the question is why we don't have any? We don't have any nice, uh, nice decompiler, uh, not uh, before mine, would say that because I am proud of the decompiler, how it works. Uh, the reason is because it's a very, very tough uh, thing to do. First of all, I, could, uh, I can even say, just say uh, you cannot build an ideal decompiler. If you want to have an ideal decompiler, something like you press a button and you have a nice everything, no. And mine, my decompiler is not like this nicer. It's not ideal. We cannot build an ideal decompiler. I will show you some examples, so you will see why. On the other hand, it's very customary to compare compilers and decompilers. It's, it's said that compilers have these steps. They preprocess, they perform lexical analysis, syntax analysis, code generation, optimization. And decompilers have more or less the same steps. We can uh, make it like this. Yes, this is true that this comparison is correct, but it's very, very superficial. In fact, if you delve into the details, you will see that nothing matches anymore, and things are very, very different. Let me show you just two samples, two uh, points. First of all, compilers are in very privileged position. They have very strictly defined input language. Anything wrong, anything something suspicious, they just print an error message and stop and their job is done. And uh, if you are a programmer, you go and uh, fix your source code. 
Compilers have a reasonable amount of information on all functions, variables, type information, everything. So they have plenty of information. They have very strictly input defined input language, and they generate, because of that, correct output. The output must be correct, yes. But it may be ugly. Nobody cares about it. Who will ever read it but us, some geeks? On the other hand, machine code decompilers, we are talking about native code decompilers, are kind of impossible because the input is informal. And more than that, it's even just plain hostile. Because sometimes your adversary is a human being that produces deliberately obfuscated code trying to make your life harder. Many decompilation problems are unsolved or proved to be unsolvable. So we are really in a hopeless situation. And the last point is that the output is examined in detail by a human being. And anything that annoys him will be reported either as a bug, either as a feature request, or anything like that. Could you do it? Could you implement it better? So the conclusion is that uh, the robust compilers are just impossible. It's a reality, and I think that it's uh, the truth. But on the other hand, OK, we cannot do this. What about trying to uh, reach something to cover the most common cases and to, uh, to, generate, to create a tool that could handle at least, let's say, 90%, 80%, as much as we can? We know that the situation is hopeless, but we still try to handle it. That's, that's, I'm telling you how I was thinking about during all these years. I was first thinking, yes, it was a good idea. It's a good idea to have a decompiler on the hand. I have this problem. I have that problem. What do, what do we do? Do we implement it? I don't know. And uh, well, one, while trying to build it, I was first, I was trying to that approach, one approach, another approach, and I found out that there's, uh, in many cases, there are very simple, naive solutions, but unfortunately, they don't work. In fact, uh, with binary analysis, it's always like that. I think that if you work on the game, you, you know that anything that you can assume, any assumption can be proven wrong. Even if you say that if you have uh, a sequence of very nice instructions like move, add, and, and, and the ending with a nice return, you say, OK, I'm looking at this code. I, this code does this and that. You may be proven wrong, because there may be an exception, for example, a deliberate exception in the middle of the uh, execution, and the execution goes somewhere else. So what you see on the screen does not correspond what is, uh, to the reality. It's not always the case. And uh, if your adversary is a human being that, uh, who writes a deliberately obfuscated code, then you, might, you, might, you can be sure that there, some, so there can be something unexpected, new trick, anything like that. So it's kind of an arms race. But anyway, uh, one thing is that if you have uh, a human being as an adversary, another thing, let's say we don't have a human being adver as an adversary, so we make our task easier. We say that we will handle only compiler-generated code and nothing else. But even compiler-generated code poses lots of problems. Take function calls. When you look at the function call, you have to answer the following questions. You have to answer where this function expects its input registers, how it returns the result, if it spoils anything, registers, memory cells, if it changes the stack pointer, and does it return to the caller or somewhere else. You have to answer all these questions. And when you analyze the code, you always answer them like in your head. But it's very hard, difficult, very, very difficult to do, thing to do, and even more difficult to formalize. Take the example on the left. We have a call, and it's indirect. So we don't know what we call. We have to do what, what, with what we have. We have only five instructions here. How can you tell how many arguments this function expects? and where they are? I cannot, because it's very difficult. I can guess what I can do. I can guess. And my educated guess, let's say, uh, I am sure that there are two arguments on the stack. 
And about the third argument, is it there? No idea. I cannot tell. I can assume that this function accepts three arguments, but maybe not. Maybe only two. Maybe the rest was just generated by the compiler, and it happens like this. If you take uh, the example on the right, again, it's very difficult to say. Apparently, it takes three arguments. They are all uh, on the stack, but we don't know if it expects anything in the register. Your temptation would say, OK, no problems. What about solving this problem by looking at the colored function? First of all, you don't have the colored function all the time. You see that we have indirect calls here. But even if you have a direct call, it's not that simple. I don't have a specific example here, but uh, it's not always possible to tell if a function uses your first naive approach would say, okay, if the function uses a register, then it must be an input argument, right? But what if the register is saved on the stack at the beginning? Is it a use or not? Maybe it's just saved and it'll be restored at the end. Maybe it will be restored in the middle of the function, so you cannot tell. Most of the cases you can solve, no problem. Most of the cases, Let's say 99% of the function, you get it right. But one function in the output is wrong. And this function, unfortunately, gets called from 200 places. So your output is plain wrong. Another example about return uh, values. The example on the left, what does it return? Usually we know that uh, the return value is in EIX. And uh, we say, OK, we know that EIX. Uh, but wha what about EDX? Do we return something there or not? Again, based on my experience, I would say, no, it doesn't. Because we subtract EDX, uh, EDX from EX. It's highly unusual that the function returns uh, both registers in this case. But maybe I'm wrong. To the left, the same problem. EDX, is it returned or not? We don't know. Well, based on the experience, we can say something, but it's mostly artificial intelligence stuff and things like that. Oh, yes, I have a uh, slide about the input arguments. So the naive assumption that if a register is used, it must be an input argument, it's wrong, because it may be uh, accessed, read, to save its value, and after you'll restore it at the end, to allocate stack frame. On the right, we have push ECX at the very beginning of the function. What happens here? Do we use ECX? Maybe not. Maybe we just allocate stack. As a human being, you also have this, all these problems, but you kind of solve them one way or another as soon as you see and encounter them. So it goes like this, and uh, sometimes you see, OK, I made the wrong assumption, and you go back and you correct things, and uh, so things work well. By the way, on the left, it's even more interesting example. You see that we use EDX. For uh, formal, uh, if you have a formal approach, you would say, okay, we have EDX, we use it. The high, the high, the, the high bits of EDX are used, but it's just an appearance. In reality, the function does not use EDX, the EDX register here. Indirect access is a problem because uh, you have pointer aliases, uh, alias problem. You don't, uh, you don't know the precise object boundaries. Uh, again, just a small example. Uh, we take the value of EC, uh, a memory cell, the arc8, and we put it into ESI. And after we do that, we do this, we do that, and after we use ESI. Pedantic, strict approach would be to generate the code on the, on the left. This way, we don't lose anything. We, are, we, are correct, uh, we generate correct code. It's correct, but it's kind of ugly. It's not optimal. And any human being and uh, many uh, users already complain why we don't put arc8 right into the call statement. 
like uh, it's done on the right. You see that uh, we have only two lines. Having two lines instead of three lines is much better. We have 30% of uh, gain. Less code, less code to read, less code to analyze, everything is better. But unfortunately, the decompiler cannot do it for you because the decompiler cannot prove that between the moment we move the value into the register and the moment we use the register, the arc 8 is not changed. It can prove about the ESI, taking some assumptions, making some assumptions, but it cannot prove for the memory, a memory cell. That's impossible. Indirect uh, jumps are also a problem. Okay, I think that I will skip this slide and just uh, you understand that you, we have to solve indirect jumps as well, but uh, they are not easy to solve. And problems, problems, problems. I, I, I will stop here because there are too many of them. So everything here can be proven that just impossible to, to solve the problem in generic case. So we, kind, we have a kind of hopeless situation. Yes and no. We can restrict ourselves to something very specific from at the beginning. Let's say we start with a simple and the quotes case. We'll generate, we'll handle only compiler generated code. So we don't have a hostile adversary human being. We'll generate only, uh, we'll handle only 32 bit code and no floating point, no exceptions, nothing, something simple, something basic. And we will have the following uh, uh, assumptions and the kind of um, basic ideas uh, how to build the decompiler. First of all, the decompiler will be configurable. The user will be able to specify the calling conventions, the stack frame sizes, the memory model, and other stuff. The decompiler will use sound theoretical approach to all solvable problems. For example, data flow analysis on registers, we can prove things uh, because registers, they don't have indirect access. The, the biggest problem is indirect access. When, something, when you have pointers to somewhere, you don't know where it points to. Potentially, it can point to any place and uh, it spoils many things. For the cases we cannot prove anything, then we will use some heuristic approach. Indirect jumps, uh, indirect jumps, function prolog, antipologs, call arguments, the problems I showed you, uh, we'll just make some rules that will work, let's say, 95% of the time. 5% of the time, they won't work. Okay, we know it, we know it in advance. That's why we say our decompiler will be interactive. So the user can go and can, can go and say change something, specify something. So to kind of direct uh, the decompiler and to uh, to change the output. Of course, we'll prefer to generate ugly but correct outputs rather than nice but incorrect code. And. And that's all, yes. And the user will be able to, to specify uh, what to do in difficult cases or when the information is not available, the user will provide it. In fact, it's the same uh, philosophy as with IDA. Why IDA is so powerful? Because IDA relies on you. You, as a human being, as an analyst, you can tell IDA that here it's code. You stupid tool, you don't understand this, you make it code here. And uh, you convert, you gave names, nice names, you, you annotate the listing. The decompiler works exactly the same, play, the same way. So if you expect something that you press a button and you have something, no, it will not work. For me, it was natural to have this the following uh, architecture. So at the bottom we have a disassembler. Uh, my choice was either Pro, of course. Uh, that reads the input file, it decodes instructions, and uh, creates function for us. So the function division is done, which is good. Uh, using IDA Pro is good uh, here as well, because uh, even uh, to separate functions from, uh, to create uh, nice uh, functions, it's again a very difficult task, uh, and uh, very difficult uh, to solve in a uh, generic case, general case, so that's why, uh, again, the user can go and uh, say, okay, this here, I have a function starting here, ending there. The next, uh, on, on top of the, the assembler, will be a, a generator that will generate a microcode. Um, 
the microcode is the name of the intermediate uh, representation, intermediate language used uh, by the decompiler. So uh, we move away from the processor-specific stuff as soon as possible, and we switch to this micro microcode. And uh, this step, uh, this uh, this layer will also handle all platform-specific aspects. And uh, the kernel is the, the, the core of the decompiler that will do everything that we need, the, uh, do decompilation. And on top of this, there will be also add-ons like plugins, visualizers, uh, other tools, and so on, so on, so on. And the decompiler would work uh, using the following phases. So first of all, we generate microcode. Uh, at the same uh, step, we also analyze the function prolog, uh, switch instructions, uh, verify that the function is uh, defined correctly, that it, it's not like a, a stray uh, move instruction, because this is not a good uh, function. A good function must end with a return or a exit or something that uh, makes sense. The next step is to optimize basic blocks one by one simplify instructions and other stuff. The next step is to glo analyze everything globally. Um, there we perform data flow analysis and uh, delete uh, dead code and other stuff. And then we allocate registers, uh, allocate local variables. In fact, we replace uh, registers by local variables. And uh, after that, we have uh, the remaining steps we do something called uh, structural analysis. We try to extract uh, the control uh, structures like while, if, switch, and other things that uh, you use in high-level languages. And after that, we can generate uh, code, pseudocode. We call, I call it pseudocode because uh, calling it C, C++, C would be, uh, it's C, in fact. But I call it pseudocode just to avoid any questions. Why does it uh, recompile? Why it doesn't do this? And like, it's a pseudocode. I don't care about recompilation. My goal, as with IDA, is not to recompile things, but to make it easy for you to understand things. So you look at the code, and you understand things. Um, the initial pseudocode that we generate is really bad. It's ugly. I will show you. So we need to transform it. And there are around uh, 100, uh, 150 maybe different rules. Oh no, less than that, less than that. I don't remember the exact number, but anyway, that make it better. Eh? Like kind of, they, these are code transformations that do not change anything. No semantics changes, nothing changes, but they still be, uh, make better. And at the end, we, I do type, type analysis. By the way, this is something that I do. Uh, the other steps, you can say that microcode generation, um, you can find uh, similar steps in other decompilers. But the type analysis, they always do it at the beginning, at the early, uh, very early stages. I think that it's a very big misconception. It, uh, the type analysis is possible only at the end, not at the beginning. Because only at the end, you have enough information to derive type information, to, uh, to, to build type equations and to solve them. And there's a final touch that to rename variables so they look nice and other stuff, it's the final stuff. I will just show some slides uh, to you use so you see how they look um, uh, in my development system, uh, in the final product, uh, you don't have this microcode, it's, everything is hidden for the moment because uh, the reason is that uh, I don't know if the, uh, the microcode will stay the same. Maybe it will change. Uh, maybe, uh, for the moment, uh, it doesn't support floating point, for example. I have to add floating point, so it will change. Microcode, as generated, is huge because every instruction is uh, translated into a sequence of micro instructions. Some instructions are skipped. For example, the first push is I skipped there. Uh, it belongs to the prolog, so we don't uh, generate it. The first move is uh, translated directly to move, but if you take the last instruction, like uh, jump zero, you will see that it's uh, the last, how many? Three instructions use this, uh, the last three micro instructions correspond to jump zero, the last three. So you see, we take the code segment, we put it into a temporary code seg, 
we put the, an offset, we put it another, into another temporary register, and after we say jump if zero flag, then we jump to this address. This is quite um, elaborate and quite uh, difficult to read. Nobody reads this, so it immediately gets optimized. And you see that it shrinks in the size. It becomes smaller, but still we have some redundancy here and uh, some unnecessary stuff like uh, uh, the initial microcode had uh, all flags, processor flags, flags everything. Uh, in fact, for, let's take uh, uh, the overflow flag, OF. I don't think that it's used anywhere in the program. It's uh, used very rarely. But uh, we do generate it anyway, because just to be precise. Uh, but we cannot remove it right now because uh, we, don't, we cannot prove it at the basic block level. Maybe another basic block use it. So uh, what happens is that we optimize it further. Uh, we optimize first local optimization. And uh, local optimization, this step uh, uh, will start already to lump instructions into big expressions. Season second instruction. You see that we have already LDX, which means load from memory. And as a memory address, we have ECX plus four already. So we have uh, microcode instructions maybe nested into each other. And this way, we naturally we will get nice expressions at the end. We still have processor, processor condition codes here, OF, CF, ZF, SF. I think that all, we, all of them will go because we already have G uh, jump zero at the end and nobody else uh, will uh, use these condition codes. And this is the task of the global optimization step. You see, uh, after the global optimization step, is very small now. The LDX register, uh, the LDX instruction got propagated into the jump instruction. So we have very nice uh, thing here. By the way, um, I, no, you cannot do it. You cannot do it here. Anyway, uh, if you noticed, we started with something reasonable, like five instructions, seven, seven instructions. We made it uh, bloat into uh, 100, 6,000, I don't know how many, bigger. And after we optimized it back into something smaller. So that's how it works. It becomes first very big, and after it shrinks size, and we get nice result at the end, very small. Uh, after that, we replace all registers and uh, stack addresses by local variables. This is something I had to devise a special algorithm for that. Uh, and uh, after that, we will uh, go and uh, perform structural analysis. Uh, what we do here, the structural analysis, it takes uh, the control graph. You see that it's very, con the control graph is very similar to the original graph view in IDA. Uh, and we have the control graph. And looking at the control graph as a human being, I can tell, OK, block number one, it passes uh, execution either to block number two or block number three, depending on some condition. So it looks like if not a condition, then we execute number two. Otherwise, we don't do anything. So it's if the if condition, the if block. Uh, if you look at the block number six, it looks like a loop. We go back. So we repeat until a condition is satisfied. The structural analysis extracts this information from the graph and represents it as a tree, like this. And uh, you see that uh, we have if, then, else, do, while, and all this information. It's uh, encoded in this tree now. And uh, this algorithm is quite robust. And I uh, use, again, something special not uh, seen in other decompilers, um, special structural analysis algorithm. It's uh, very robust. It can handle any, any graph. I even run it uh, on random graphs. I was generating random graph and running uh, this uh, algorithm. So it, even if you have a really bad graph with many, many uh, edges, it will generate all necessary go-tos. So you will still have an output. Maybe the output will be really difficult to read because you have too many edges, uh, or in other words, too many go-tos. But it still will be possible. That we generate pseudocode based on this uh, uh, on this uh, tree and based on our pseudocode, we can say, for example, uh, uh, block number uh, twelve here. 
on the lower right corner, it's a block. A block means that we have just a linear execution. So we have to generate code for the block number 10 and after to for the block number 11. I think that this block corresponds to the last three instructions, to the last, to the last three lines. We call a subroutine, we copy the result, and we return. The output is correct because we generate all cats uh, that in the but uh, there are too many cats. It's, uh, in fact, it's almost unreadable. Again, this is not visible to anyone. Uh, the decompiler immediately applies transformation rules to that, and it generates something like that. This is almost readable. This is something that the uh, decompiler can give you, but after that, you have to improve it. As the same way as with IDA. When you just take a listing, you, you should not take it as for uh, given. You must improve it. Here, we have some casts, for example, this plus four, and we, uh, we have a cast here, put the double board, a pointer, and we uh, dereference it. We take a value at that address. Uh, why so complex? Why so awkward? The reason is uh, that the decompiler does not know that this is a pointer. It thinks that it's just a normal integer, and by the rules of the C language, you cannot dereference a point, uh, an integer. That's why it puts a double word like this. A good type analysis, a very good type analysis could deduce, looking at the code, say, okay, we have this plus four. Apparently, at this plus four, we have a pointer. Unfortunately, the, the type uh, recovery uh, algorithm that we use in, uh, right now, it's not very good, not, not, not good enough. It will be improved in the future, but for the moment, you have to do it yourself. For example, we have to tell that this, I think that it's a pointer to a structure. Usually, it's a pointer to a structure. Uh, V1 is a uh, copy of this, so it must be the same thing. Uh, the same way in either, you go and say, I want to change the type of this, type of uh, this or that, or uh, V1 or anything. And you can change things. You can, by just saying that this is a pointer, the out, you can change, modify the output uh, this way. You can add comments, you can uh, rename variables, functions, you can do everything you want. Uh, please note that the initial assembly was too long to be displayed on one slide, so that's why I did not even display it. But uh, the final result is quite simple. I think that it's better now to switch to some demos and show you how, uh, how it works. Because a live demo is always better than slides. Okay, we have a function here. It takes one argument, as we see, and after we take, um, we put this argument, we, uh, we, we take plus, plus eight, we put it into edx, edx plus four, all that stuff. You see that you have to analyze this. Okay, I'm lazy, I just ask the decompiler to generate an output for me. I press tab, and that's what I have. Uh, in general, decompilation is very fast. It's almost instantaneous, so, Unless in some cases it can take really huge time uh, if you have uh, a function, let's say, 200 kilobytes of code, then it will take time, yeah. It will take even, it may take even uh, an hour or even more, longer. Well, that's how it works. Uh, but uh, I'm not satisfied this by, with the output. You see that we have E1 plus 4 plus 8, all that stuff. Um, it's not good. Again, why it happened? Because the decompiler does not know that A1 is a pointer. Okay, I will tell it. I will right click and say, please create, uh, there are many ways of doing it. I can say, I want to set the type manually, I can convert it, I can convert to a structure pointer. In this case, I am really lazy, I will just ask, please create a new structure type for me, like this. This is what uh, is proposed uh, by the decompiler. It looked at the code and found that there are references uh, like this, I just accept it. Still not that good. I think that I better go another way. I, in fact, I have uh, already, uh, I will show you. I have, uh, in fact, the argument that we are having, it's a pointer to a graph that has some nodes, as you see here. 
and um, and each node has uh, an array of successors and predecessors, and it has also some attributes. And each attribute has an ID, has a name, a type, value. So you see, it's uh, quite standard stuff. What I will do? I will explain all this to, uh, to the decompiler. It's very easy to do. First of all, I will tell Ida, ask Ida to to parse the file, the file that I have, parse the C header file. This is not something that comes from the decompiler. This is something that basic functionality that exists in Ida since long time. The compilation is successful. So I have all my types ready. And now I say that A1, I know the type. It's not a pointer to uh, struct A1. It's a pointer to graph underscore T. So it's a pointer. I put star. And I press OK. And that's OK. I think that this is the best you can have. Can I, of course, I can rename this. I can call graph like this. So I have, is it visible enough? No, let me make uh, the font, font bigger. I think that the font is too small. Is it better like this? So instead of this code, you have to decipher anyway. You have only this code. Yes, you have to explain things first. You have to display, uh, explain the types. But as soon as you do, you have very nice code. Another sample. What is this? OK, you have a uh, function that takes some arguments and calls string compare many times, calls, makes some comparisons, you see, jump zero many times, and after it calls print, and that's it. OK, uh, instead of looking at this code, I just press tab. And that's what I have. In fact, the, the whole function is one if in statement. If this, 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 or that, or this, and so on, so on, the result is 0. Otherwise, the result is 1. Apparently, here we just check the, some, we, we perform some checks, and uh, we do this or that. By the way, I can now uh, replace things. I can say, this is, I know that it is, uh, let's say, uh, OK. OK, I will just rename it OK. And after I will say that this 0 is, is false, and this is true, and these numbers, OK, I don't like them. I change them, for example, into hexadecimal. Well, hexadecimal is not good. I will change it to characters. Ah, characters look nice. You see, you can you do the, the same things as with IDA. And without doing these things, the output looks ugly. And I think that this is, uh, I will call it magic. And uh, I can add a comment saying failed. See that the comments are here. So the compiler is interactive, fully interactive, uh, as you might suspect. Another sample, another example, what we do here. We create something. OK, I will press, oh, it's, here we have a loop. We have to do this, something. Anyway, I will just press tab. OK. Again, you have a nice function. And uh, you see that uh, the compiler could uh, real, uh, recognize the for statement, the for loop. Apparently, here we take, uh, OK, what do we do here? We take a malloc, we allocate some size. Uh, OK, we take some memory. And after we initialize this with uh, uh, some values starting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, up to size. And the second, what we do here, we, uh, we, we swap them. OK. So looking at this code is much easier to read than this code. It's uh, out of question that you can read. The, this code is also readable, but you spend much more time. You have to say, OK, this push, what is, what is this? OK, we just save a register. The decompiler hides all this information and just shows you a nice, uh, nice result. Okay, do I have anything else to show? Okay, here we have a sequence of calls, calls, calls. I see that we call init sub, uh, init sub uh, many times. Okay, just press it. Yeah, I like this better. So we have a nice, almost a table. So we initialize files, segments, uh, functions, registers, and so on. Easy to read again. What else here? Main. 
for me at least, uh, maybe because I spent so much time with C code, you spent a lot of time with assembly code. Maybe that's why you would prefer this, uh, especially you, if you never programmed in C. Uh, but if you program in C, you see that the, the difference is uh, just uh, very big. This is for the demo, and um, I think that we can switch to the slides. <coughs> so the obvious benefits of the decompiler is that uh, we have, we save time. We look at the code. Uh, yes, you have to make sure that uh, currently, uh, looking at the code, uh, you, must, you must make sure that, for example, this short circuit takes three, three arguments. But since it's very easy to switch between the uh, assembly and the uh, pseudocode, it's very easy to verify. If you suspect that something is wrong because maybe it's guessed wrongly, then you can just uh, press tabulation and see, okay, you, you verify it visually like this. So it saves time. It re eliminates routine tasks, so you get less bored, you stay more alert and attentive. And uh, also it makes the source code recovery easier. And here I have uh, kind of I don't know. If, uh, I know that there are some legitimate reasons to recover source code, but I, I see another obvious use of uh, source code recovery to steal the uh, other's code, and this is something I'm totally against. That's why well, this is one of the reasons why I say no. The output is not uh, meant to be uh, recompilable. I'm sorry. It's to analyze code. It's uh, to understand code, not to uh, recover source code. Of course, there are many things to do in the decompiler, and there will be always new things to do. Um, and uh, there are also tools that we could build on the top of the decompiler, like uh, we can go into the next level. Currently, we don't uh, uh, even try to re uh, recover the, uh, the structure information to rebuild objects. This is something that could be done, and this, will be, uh, this way we will move closer to the application domain. We could also rename variables. We could uh, give them some more meaningful name. For the moment, right now, we just have names like v1, v2, v3. And so it's your responsibility to go and rename them. Um, one obvious tool is uh, a vulnerability scanner based on the decompiler that would use the data flow analysis results and uh, try to something. I just have no, not enough time. I would do it myself, but uh, so that's why if someone wants to write a vulnerability scan on top, on the top of the active decompiler, why not? Uh, right now, the API, uh, it's already open. Uh, the decompiler has an API, so you can write uh, your plugins, play with them, and everything like that. Um, but the uh, internal stuff, the microcode, is, uh, for the moment, it's hidden. It's not. Uh, available, uh, accessible from, uh, from your plugins. By the way, the, comp the compiler could be also used for binary translation for, to port the code from uh, one processor to another processor. You have code for Intel, you port it to ARM, from ARM to, uh, why not? In principle, it's doable. Well, so right now we have a nice solid base to build on, and I hope that it will continue. So uh, the core is processor independent already. Uh, right now we support only x86 and uh, ARM will be next, and uh, there will be also floating point instructions and other stuff. Uh, batch mode is supported. Uh, but there are maybe other tools as well that you could think of and I could think of. Uh, I just tried to give you some ideas. Uh, things that uh, on these slides, they don't exist. First of all, uh, it's not, uh, I wouldn't call it a vulnerability scanner, just something that verifies the programs that uh, could find something like, uh, for example, if uh, the tool, uh, uh, proves that a function may return a null, but at the call side, the return value is not compared against null, then we have a potential problem. I don't say that it's a real problem, but we have something wrong here. The same applies to the input values. Uh, 
It can be, what about uh, also performing taint analysis, finding insecure code patterns. It's much easier to find these patterns in uh, the decompiled code because you have uh, all this uh, um, minor stuff like the register names uh, and other stuff uh, already disappeared. You have high level code. It's easier to write uh, pattern matching there. What about finding uninitialized variables and other things? So a tool that would verify binary code. And all these things, they are potential bugs, or maybe they are potential even vulnerabilities. Why not? On the other hand, the decompiler could be also used to improve the assembly. So the results of the decompilation could be moved, copied back to the disassembly listing and make it easy to read. Or we just, uh, we just could uh, make it uh, possible to hover the mouse over a register and uh, the plugin would show its possible values, the locations where it's defined or it's used and other stuff. So we could highlight definitions or uses of the current register in two different colors and many other ideas. Well, anyway, I think that I will not stop on these things in detail. I think that you can come up with your own ideas uh, as well. No, uh, all this stuff, uh, I'm, I personally am very, very interested in all this stuff. Because doing this will help you, will make your life much, much easier. Just you see that, okay, this value is red, this register is colored red. It means that uh, we could not find where it's initialized. It's uninitialized register. How can it be? And, okay, you have something to, to look at. Well, I already thought... Uh, discussed uh, this stuff that uh, we need a better type uh, type recovery. And I think that, again, uh, as uh, with other many problems, uh, this is an endless story and we cannot make it a perfect solution immediately. So uh, we will uh, start with something simple and uh, you may have your own plugins that uh, import data inform type information into the, uh, into either into the decompiler. Also, this uh, decompiler could be used to uh, to generate uh, to to find some statistical to, to, to perform some statistical analysis uh, to cluster functions depending on their uh, type on their structural uh, uh, structural properties uh, and other stuff. So I don't know. I just try to give you some ideas, but um, I think that. Uh, Binary code comparison, yeah, just one idea, why not? By the way, I was doing it uh, from time to time when Microsoft released the patch, just to check like, like this. Uh, it doesn't work all the time because uh, when the code is moved uh, around, then it uh, becomes difficult. But uh, most of the time it gives you good results and uh, shows you which function is changed. But anyway, I think that all this stuff is uh, very interesting, but um, well, we have to implement it. <laughs> the only thing. But since we have uh, a nice base, and uh, I'll try to keep it as open as possible. I mean that uh, with API, with uh, with the SDK, so you can write your own plugins and uh, uh, improve the analysis and all that stuff. So we have many things to do, and I think that we are in position to implement most of the things. Again, it won't be perfect, it won't be ideal, but it will be something that uh, we can do. Well, uh, that's all. I maybe rushed at the end a little bit just to make, uh, to make sure that uh, I don't go too far. Anyway, so thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, Feel free to ask. Any questions from the floor? Yeah. Can you talk about uh, how you handle C++ code versus C code? Uh, right now, uh, the decompiler can handle, uh, in fact, any code. It's, it can be C++, C, Fortran. Uh, assembly with some assumptions that you have nice functions there and they return um, nicely and all that stuff. Uh, 
it can, it's not compiler dependent. It doesn't use anything like pattern matching that uh, if you have this, then it's this. Uh, so, but everything is mapped to C. So even if the initial language was Fortran, it will map it to C. C++ will be mapped to C as well. And the decompiler is uh, capable of handling uh, uh, passing arguments by, uh, not only by reference, but by, by value, structures by value as well. This, is, this was quite difficult to handle, but uh, the decompiler handles them uh, okay, let's say. And uh, you have a C output. And I would say to decompile into C++, what you should do, you should take this output, write a plugin that would leverage it, that would uh, move it uh, to C++. Because C++ mapped, maps into C very nicely. And in fact, everything that you have C++, let's say almost everything, can be represented in C without big problems. Of course, you have inline functions, templates, and all this information. I'm sorry, it's lost, and again, you have to um, reverse this manually. But uh, C++ is one of the possible di directions, let's say, as a plugin. I don't consider this as a part of the main core engine. It's good enough. It's, it's better uh, to have a nice core engine that is, uh, pro pro uh, produces nice C code, and after that, to, to have an addition, a plugin, that will uh, convert C into C++ using this type information and all that stuff. Yeah, why not? Does it answer your question? Okay, anyone else? All right, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you.